Hi, I'm Tim McKay. Join me in this video to talk about remote ID. Remote ID is a recent rule from the FAA where you have to have a tracking device on your drone or RC model aircraft to deconflict from other traffic in the airspace. Is remote ID even legal? Well, somebody took the FAA to federal court and we will find out the results of that in this video. Let's get to it. As I mentioned in the intro, remote ID is the ability for the FAA to track your drone or RC model aircraft in the airspace for safety. It's a recent rule promulgated by the FAA in January of uh, 2021. It has a lot of controversy because a lot of modelers are upset that the FAA can do something like this. So the question is, is remote ID even legal? So we'll get to that in a moment. First of all, a little bit of background for people uh, that might be new to remote ID or just to frame the discussion. Um, as more and more aircraft are flying in the national airspace system, especially ready to fly electric powered drones, there have been increasing cases of aircraft flying in spaces they shouldn't have been, airports, close calls to other airplanes, and people, the FAA Congress, realized something had to be done at some point to integrate drones into the national airspace system. Now, in this video, I'm going to be using the term drones a lot. Uh, those typically refer to quadcopters, ready-to-fly, electric-powered um, uh, aircraft. However, from the FAA's viewpoint, they look at them as small unmanned aircraft systems, whether it's a drone or an RC model airplane, like a lot of us have been flying for decades, they are all considered the same because there's no person in the aircraft for air traffic control responsibilities. The problem is technology. You ju we just don't have any technology to adequately identify these drones in any sort of affordable manner. However, in 2017, Congress told the FAA, we really got to start thinking about this. And in 2017 to 2019, as part of the FAA Reauthorization Act, Congress told the FAA, come up with a plan for remote ID for these drones and RC model aircraft in the national airspace system. The FAA did so. They put out a draft rule. Um, this is typical when you're making a big uh, change to the regulations. The draft ruling generated 53,000 53, responses from users. I sent in a response about what was good about it, what could have been different. And then in January of 2021, the FAA put out the final rule on remote ID that we would have to follow. Now, to the credit of the FAA, they did participate with industry groups, uh, aircraft owning groups, uh, the Academy of Model Aeronautics to make sure they had an understanding of all the stakeholders of the remote ID. Remember, a huge part of the discussion with drones regards commercial operators. As hobbyists, sometimes we don't have a clear vision of that. I'll have more information later on the commercial operators. The commercial operators are important because there are a lot of them. They have a lot of money, and they're very interested in safe operations of their drones. They are huge supporters of remote ID. But one change that the FAA did make in the remote ID rule was when the initial ruling came out, the idea was before anybody flew a drone or an RC model airplane, they had to log on to the internet so that the drone could be tracked throughout their whole flight and it was stored in a central location. Modelers, the AMA pointed out that in many parts of the country, say in North Dakota, there, there is no cell phone coverage. There's no way to connect to the internet to do something like this. The FAA accepted that, they backed off, and so now the requirement for remote ID is just a continually, continuously broadcast signal while the drone is flying. You don't have to log on. It just is a broadcast signal to be picked up by the FAA as you're flying. So the remote ID is in place. There are two important dates that we need to be aware of as modelers. The first date is September 16th, 2022. That is the date when all manufacturers had to comply with a remote ID in order to sell a drone. The problem is this is being filmed on December 16th, 2022. The FAA could not meet that date of September 16th. And so they slipped the manufacturer compliance date to December 16th, 2022, which is today right now. There right now is no FAA approved compliance with a remote ID from the manufacturers. Several manufacturers claim that they have a remote ID built into their drones. 
It's a firmware update. They believe they're going to be compliant. However, the FAA is working with the American Society for Testing of Materials to verify that what is required on remote ID actually works with remote ID. That is not settled yet. So that is still a work in progress. What's going to happen is the FAA knows that they cannot shut down the entire commercial drone manufacturing industry for lack of compliance. What they're going to do as the holidays coming up, what is going to happen is the FAA will probably establish a new date in 2023 to be compliant. And what they say in this slipping of the decision, the FAA is simply not going to um, go forward with any enforcement action on the remote ID manufacturer requirement until a future date, whenever that happens. That's all in the background. It doesn't really matter to us as flyers. The other date that's very important for us as modelers is when do we have to use remote ID? When do we have to have it in our models when we're flying? And the answer to that is September 16th, 2023. It's about nine months from now. So after September 16th, 2023, all RC models flying have to have remote ID. This will either be um, for the manufacturer when you buy it, a, or a module that you put in. But none of these exist, this is just in the future. There are three exceptions where you do not have to have remote, uh, remote ID. I repeat, three exceptions where you do not need to comply with remote ID. The first one is if your model weighs less than 250 grams. That's about 8.8 .8 ounces. This model of Aguila Zaranka, link is in the description if you want to build it weighs three ounces. This is less than 8.8 .8 ounces. I do not need remote ID. The idea is this is so small and lightweight, if it were to hit somebody or something, it's just not gonna cause any damage. So under 250 grams, 8.8 .8 ounces, you do not need remote ID. The other thing is you do not need remote ID if you're flying in a FRIA. FRIA is part of the regulation, uh, part of the rule. It stands for FAA Recognized Identification Area. FRIAs are geographic areas defined by the FAA with a geographical outline, probably under 400 feet above ground level, where if you fly within that FRIA, you do not need any remote ID for your models. The way the FAA will determine FRIAs is they will work with community-based organizations. Community-based organizations are being defined by the uh, FAA. It's interesting to note the Academy of Model Aeronautics was awarded a community-based organization designation by the FAA last month in November of 2022. That's really a pretty significant milestone, something the AMA should be proud of. So now that the AMA is a community-based organization, they can start getting applications from AMA clubs around the country to have the clubs designated as a FRIA, FAA Recognized Identification Area, so as modelers, members of the FAA flying in our club fields, we do not have to worry about remote ID so long as we fly within the defines of our club area. So that's gonna give us a lot of flexibility for people flying normal RC models for the drone peoples outside of um, the club zones. It'll be, they're gonna to have to have the remote ID. And the third exemption from the remote ID, I mentioned under 250 grams in a FRIA, if you fly indoors, you don't have to have that. The idea of being indoors, you're not a threat to any other aircraft. There's a lot of people that fly indoors. When I lived in Chicago for nine years, with the wind and the cold weather, we did an awful lot of RC flying indoors. So that's for your background knowledge. So that's the background or remote ID, why we, why it, we had to have it. Congress has directed the FAA to do it. And also there's very strong industry support for this. I know a lot of modelers, I get a lot of comments that this is unfair, it's impinging on our freedom. Um, I have been flying for a long time. I got my private pilot certificate in 1973 in a Cessna 150. Uh, had some time flying in the Air Force. My most recent aircraft is a Boeing 777. I'm relatively familiar with the FAA and the regulatory environment. What we're seeing with remote ID is a fairly normal outgrowth as more and more aircraft are flying and less and less uh, airspace being crowded. The FAA can and does imply um, requirements on aircraft with its transponders, training requirements, et cetera. The problem we face with our RC models and drones in the national airspace system is there's no pilot on board, obviously. And a bedrock principle of safety on the FAA is see and avoid. In other words, pilots and aircraft can see the other aircraft and avoid the aircraft. 
Even a Cessna 172 flying into Atlanta airport, the pilot in that Cessna is legal to do that, so long as they're not a student pilot, because they can see and avoid other aircraft in addition to the transponder talking to controllers getting clearances. With drones, we just can't do that. So something had to be done. This something is a remote ID. So, as I mentioned, some modelers are upset about this, and there is one modeler, I'm going to refer to my notes here, um, his name is Tyler Brennan, and back a few months ago, uh, Tyler is a quadcopter operator. He has a business in um, Orlando, Florida called Race Day Quads. He decided to do something about this. So he went on social media. Um, he raised $83,000 from 2,000 people that donated to him, and he took the FAA to court over the remote ID on two situations. He says the surveillance of the drones is an invasion of his privacy under the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, and the FAA made some procedural errors not coordinating with enough people when they implemented the rule. And this went up to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. That's a pretty, pretty senior court in there. Well, to cut to the chase, on July 29th, 2022, it was a three-judge panel, it was unanimous. He lost his case. Uh, the judge said, or the, or the judges said that this uh, remote ID is totally legal. Now, it's not the end of the discussion. There could be further lawsuits, but this is the first step, and it's worthwhile to take a little, uh, listen a little bit to the reasoning, what the judge says, to have a further understanding for any other legal channels that may come up. So the lead judge, uh, Cornelia Pillard, said in her decision against um, Tyler, Quote, drones are coming, lots of them. They are fun and useful, but the drone's ability to pry, spy, crash, and drop things poses real risks. Free-for-all drone use threatens air traffic, people, and things on the ground, even national security. So let's talk a little bit about that. This is not, I'm not a lawyer, but what one of the things Tyler said was that it infringed, infringed upon his rights under the Fourth Amendment. So the Fourth Amendment is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, oftentimes called the Bill of Rights. I'll read what was written in 1787, then a little bit of a translation. So the Fourth Amendment says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched, the persons or things. What this means is that the government, a police officer, FBI, whatever, cannot just enter your house and search your house or something because they feel like it. It doesn't mean they can't do searches. It's just no unreasonable searches. So the way the Fourth Amendment is understood, individuals in America, we have a sphere of privacy. Uh, two examples are inside our house and our person. We're walking down the street. We just can't be stopped and searched. Show your papers. However, if the government feels that a crime or an illegal activity is happening, they can go to a judge. If they convince the judge that this is correct, a warrant is issued, and they can use this warrant to enter my house or search me as necessary. And what the complaint of Tyler was, by surveilling drone activity flying around, they're violating our privacy because they can continuously monitor the drones flying around. The, um, so that's basically it. It's, the Fourth Amendment is not a guarantee against all searches and seizures, only those that are deemed unreasonable under the law. What had happened to the decision, the judges did not accept that reasoning because they said the FAA does not continually monitor your drone. First of all, the only time they even know that you're flying is when you're airborne and you are put out a signal showing things like altitude, location, where the drone took off. There's no personal identifying information until that information is connected with an FAA database. And they said, just because you're broadcasting for short periods of time, and oh, by the way, you're flying in public airspace, you have no right to privacy from that. It's the same thing as driving down uh, in your car on a public road or walking down a street. You don't have the same claims to privacy as you do in your house. The judge continued in the ruling against Tyler, saying drone pilots generally lack any reasonable expectation of privacy in the location of their drone systems during flight. Search for the purposes of the Fourth Amendment occurs on government action, infringes a spare, and an individual seeks to preserve his private, and the expectation of privacy is one society considers reasonable under the circumstances. 
In addition, for the procedural things, Tyler said the FAA did not coordinate with appropriate groups. It didn't give sufficient weight to the comments. The judge goes, the FAA did what they were supposed to do in these rulemakings. They followed all the procedures, so that was thrown out. The other thing I wanted to bring up on this ruling were there were other organizations that filed amicus briefs, otherwise known as friend of the court briefs. Very often there's a legal case, there might be a group that has a very strong interest in the outcome of that case, but they're not part of the lawsuit, so they have no legal standing to be in front of the judge. What they can do, though, is file a legal brief giving information that they feel would be helpful for the judge as they decide how to come out, hopefully in their favor. The judge is under no obligation to even follow these, but it's, it's absolutely normal to do something like this. And I think this gives a better understanding to the other very large groups involved in this whole drone discussion within the U.S. Because remember, in our national airspace system, the Pentagon last year spent $700 million on drone, military drone operations, research, development, et cetera. That's a lot of money uh, because drones are going to be necessary for the military to do its function. In addition, we've all read about the industries that are just happening almost overnight in drones, everywhere from crop dusting, pipeline inspection, uh, real-time transport of uh, organs between hospitals and, and accident sites. There's a lot going on. These industry players, FedEx, UPS, and so forth, are very, very interested in remote ID because they see a good remote ID process as a necessary foundation for the growth and expansion of this industry, which could be huge over the years to come. It's just a fact of life. So in line with this, for the brief that Tyler filed against the FAA, there was a group I'd never even heard of. It was called the Association for Uncrewed Vehicle Systems International, AUVSI. The, the link will be um, in the description. This is the world's largest um, nonprofit group for unmanned operators. It has um, offices, contacts in over 60 countries, 7,500 members. Their annual conventions have over 8,000 people. This is a lot of people. And their president, uh, Brian Wynn, the CEO of AUVSI, stated that numerous industries are relying on drones for their operations. Significant industry growth is expected in the years ahead. Accordingly, the FAA issued a remote ID rule that appropriately advances drone integration in a way that increases safety for all airspace users. By harmonizing the needs of commercial and law enforcement stakeholders, the rule supports scalable, secure, sustainable commercial drone operations. The final remote ID rule is absolutely necessary for the continued expansion of drone operations and the fulfillment of Congress's vision of an integrated airspace that brings significant benefits to the American people. In addition, the Consumer Technology Association applauded the decision. They had a brief as well. So that's kind of the state of play. With has been a court case, three judge federal court rejected it over privacy. Um, we still don't have a FAA approved functioning way for remote ID. It was due today, December 16th, 2022, to be determined when that will happen. The remote ID rule needs to be, we need to follow it as models of September um, 16th, 2023, either built in when you buy it and even an old one, you can have the firmware update or module. I firmly believe that the industry will come up with something relatively inexpensive for a module for our RC model aircraft to be compliant. And I do all of my flying at a club airfield when the FRIAs are in place. I don't have to worry about it at the club airspace under the FRIA. So this is just an update. And to answer the question that I originally posed, is the remote ID Rule proposed by the FAA legal. Yes, it is legal so far. It's had one court challenge. It can certainly have more to be determined the final outcome, but so far it survived the first challenge. Still waiting for industry to come up with solutions, and then we'll see what happens on September 16th, 2023 for our flying activities. So thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you on the next video.